Good afternoon, everyone. This is Steve Wilkes at the Wagner Law Group. Thank you very much for joining us today. We apologize for our little technical hitches, but we look forward to having a good session and, and glad that you are glad that you are with us. Today we're going to talk about the various kinds of retirement plans that are available in the, uh, you know, in the private sector uh, and the public sector for that matter, and some of their basic features and requirements. And I'll also talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of, of uh, different, different kinds of plans. But first, you know, why this topic? And hopefully it's, it's obvious if you are a plan sponsor listening in today, designing and implementing uh, a plan that fits your employee base and then administering the plan properly uh, in, under the appropriate terms and conditions and in compliance with the various legal requirements is really complicated. There's a lot of things to keep track of and we hope that this adds to and enhances your learning. If you are a financial advisor, it is very likely that you are the, if not one of the, primary resource people for the plan sponsor. And even though your focus may be on the investment side, we know that you are often asked about various administrative issues, plan design issues, day-to-day -day problems that come up. So hopefully this session will add to your knowledge and enable you to work more closely with your underlying plan clients. So first I should mention ERISA uh, just quickly, which is the federal law that regulates retirement plans. Um, I, I think it's important to, to know that that the the uh, plan world can be broken out into different segments. We have tax qualified plans. We could talk about IRAs and IRA plans. And we could talk about non qualified plans. Now today we're going to focus primarily on qualified retirement plans. And maybe I'll mention a few comparisons with non qualifieds as we go through. And we're also going to forego for today all the fiduciary requirements and responsibilities under ERISA. That's all best saved for another day. And many of you have participated or attended our webinars on those topics in the past. And then I'll finish off with some maybe some guidelines for how to select, you know, the best type of plan for your business. You know, in selecting the, the plan for your business and complying uh, with the particular requirements for the type of plan you selected are critical. Although the establishment of a plan is voluntary, you know, once the plan's been established, you have to comply with all the legal and regulatory requirements. Any violation of the law, even if it's unintentional, innocent, non-injurious, it can result in severe sanctions, and in some cases, personal liability for, for planned fiduciaries, or maybe even loss of plan qualification. So just very quickly, uh, to set the frame, a little overview uh, on ERISA. ERISA is the federal law that governs plans, and it was really the first comprehensive set of law for uh, sets of law for employee benefits, including plans. Before that, before 74, you had a lot of provisions under the Internal Revenue Code that were standalone. And the goal at the time was to protect the interests of plan participants by updating and replacing, you know, old law with a standardized set of reporting and disclosure, investing and benefit accruals and certain fiduciary standards and certain preemption features of ERISA law over state law, and also to define some also to define prohibited transactions. Um, ERISA is divided into four pieces. You have Title I, the Department of Labor piece, you know, the, what we typically refer to as, as ERISA fiduciary law. Title II are all the Internal Revenue Code provisions. Title III relates to the coordination of federal agencies. And Title IV is the PBGC, uh, which is Pension Plan Termination Insurance. So the thing about tax qualified plans, uh, one of the things that makes them so popular is they have certain favor very favorable uh, tax features. So if a plan's qualified, it means that it's going to be qualified under Section 401A of the code and the employees are going to get some benefits, the employer is going to get some benefits, and the trust that holds the plan assets is going to get some benefits too. And, you know, employees with a vested benefit don't have to, you know, count the benefits in their gross income or recognize them until they actually receive them. And that's pretty powerful. The, the Roth scheme that's come, of, come into being in the last couple of years is, you know, is a little bit different.
um, an employer sponsoring a plan is going to have a corresponding tax advantage of having deductibility. And of course, as I said, you know, the, the trust itself is generally exempt from federal income taxation, which allows for a tax-free accumulation of, you know, income earned inside the plan. Now, there are two main flavors of plan out there. One is known as defined contribution. The other is known as defined benefit. Um, a lot, of the, a lot of the qualification requirements overlap for both kind of plans. Then there are some that are singular, that relate only to a 401k, for example, or only to a defined benefit plan. So defined contribution plans, uh, you know, the amount payable to an employee on or after the termination of employment, it's basically measured by the value of an individual account maintained for that employee. And every account, you know, is, is tracked with its own accounting records and, these accounts are adjusted to reflect contributions made by the employer or the employee, if any, investment income, and realized and unrealized gains and losses. So examples of defined contribution plans are profit sharing plans, money purchase pension plans, 401k plans, ESOPs, and uh, thrift plans. Defined benefit plans, which are old school, and there aren't as many of them as there used to be, there are different uh, a different genre, really. They're under a defined benefit plan, a participant is entitled to receive a predetermined amount uh, at regular intervals upon retirement, uh, according to a formula. And it's usually payable in the form of monthly checks for the remaining life of the participant or maybe extended over the life of the participant and his or her partner or spouse. And it's the, the actual benefit level is determined by a formula. The key factors there are usually the number of years of service, or the uh, and I should say the, the compensation for for given years of of service. Then we have some hybrid plans, uh, which you all have heard about. We have cash balance plans. Those are defined benefit plans that they sort of imitate in some ways a defined contribution plan by by expressing every participant's accrued benefit uh, as a hypothetical individual account that's adjusted periodically to reflect hypothetical earnings on hypothetical contributions credited in that year. We have age or service weighted profit sharing plans. Uh, they they can they um, they mimic the benefit accrual of a defined benefit with a a subsidized benefit for early retirement because the plan will allocate employer contributions according to age or service as well as compensation. Then you have target benefit plans, which they they sort of mimic defined benefit plans as well. So there's all all different kinds out there. Now. And it's important for you uh, sponsors when you're choosing your plans and advisors when you're working with your clients to be aware of the variety that's available, even though obviously the very strong trend these days is in the 401k space. Now, there are some general requirements that apply to all plans. You know, the, the proposition behind a qualified plan is really pretty simple. An employer gets a deduction. An employee can maybe, you know, make above-the-line contributions if it's a 401k, the money grows on a tax-deferred basis until it's taken out of the trust. Very simple, alluring concept. But the rules that apply to get those benefits are incredibly complicated. Uh, some of the basic qualification requirements that relate to all plans, um, the plan must be in writing, The plan, and you know, there must be plan provisions that are written out. Um, the plan must be established for the benefit of employees and the beneficiaries. And that's interesting given the, the um, especially given the recent interest, renewed interest, I should say, in distinguishing employees versus independent contractors. Because one of the, one of the downsides of a mistaken classification for an independent contractor is that not only have you maybe failed on the withholding of their employment taxes and what have you, but they may have been improperly excluded from a qualified plan or from, you know, stock option plan or any, any other kind of program that the employer maintains as well. Uh, assets have to be held in trust. There's a general ban on a reversion of assets. Um, there's an anti-alienation rule. In other words, third parties, you know, can't garnish the benefits. The limited exceptions for quadros and things like that. Um, there's, no, uh, there's no cutback of benefits. Um, there are definite rules on distributions in terms of the forms they must take, when they must take, when you can force someone out of the plan in terms of a in terms of a cash out, and um, minimum distribution rules. So there's there's a lot there that apply across the board. I'm sure you've all all heard about some of those before. 
eligibility um, is an area that has its own set of rules. As a general proposition, you don't have to let every employee participate in a plan, though we certainly support the notion, as many uh, professionals in the retirement world do, of automatic enrollment. We think it's good policy and what have you. But there might be situations where it doesn't make sense to include everyone. So you can you can set up some um, some hurdles, if you will. You can have some conditions to eligibility. You can deny eligibility to employees who are under 21 years of old, for example. You can establish a waiting period for um, for you know for how long you've worked there before you can can come in. You know this year what we, what's known as a year of service participation requirement. And then there are some ways that you can calculate years of service and determine the measuring period and and factor in and out breaks in service for for eligibility. There's also some different scenarios on vesting. Retirement plans are typically written so that you know a participant has the right to the payment of the benefits that he or she accrues based uh, you know on services provided during a period of time. And you're allowed to have a, a vesting or an earning schedule, if you will. So back you know before uh, before 2007, the old rule you know there was five-year cliff vesting which meant that you could have zero up until the fifth year and then 100% or seven-year graded vesting schedule. But now for employer matching contributions uh, and for employer contributions to a defined contribution plan made starting in, in uh, January 1, 2007, you have a different set of rules apply. You have a three-year cliff and six-year graded. So there are, different, there are different vesting schedules out there depending on the time period, whether it's employee or employer. And those are all part of the design of uh, of the plan because if a participant terminates before he or she becomes fully vested under the applicable vesting schedule, the non-vested portion of benefits uh, can be forfeited. And typically these either go to pay, you know, expenses of the plan, reasonable administrative expenses, I should say, or maybe they can be used to reduce um, uh, future contributions of the employer. It's also important to remember that um, Benefits are protected in certain scenarios. When a plan is terminated, everyone becomes fully vested. When a plan is spun off or merged, uh, the benefits to which a participant was entitled after the merger or spin off have to be at least as good or at least equal to the benefits which you had before the merger or spin off. You can't make an amendment that reduces an accrued benefit. This is known as the anti cutback rule. Once you have it, you have it. Going forward, you can change the benefit formula, but you can't take away retrospectively. There are coverage requirements that apply in terms of not, not once you identify the class of people who are eligible to participate, then you get into the question of, okay, how many of them are actually in the plan? And you have to satisfy coverage requirements. And these generally, to put it in plain English, these generally deal with how many of the non-highly non compensated employees um, are, are uh, participating in the plan. There are certain minimum thresholds that have to be satisfied. So. Um, you know a plan covered, and, and you know you're covered if you're in a defined benefit plan. If you've accrued a benefit during that year, that means you're covered that year. In a defined contribution plan like a 401k, you have the right to make contributions during the year, or you're accredited with an employer contributions during the year. Um, you're going to be you're going to be deemed to have been in that plan. And there are minimum coverage requirements. There's alter, there's a ratio percentage test where um, the percentage of covered non-highly compensated is compared to the percentage of covered highly compensated, and this has to be at least 70%. There's an average benefits test, which takes into account factors like the relative degree to which um, financial advantages are conferred under the plan uh, to the employees in these categories, and whether certain minimum participant participation rates are achieved. And you can apply these in more complex situations. You can apply these tests on a combined basis, you know, to one or more plans. You can you can apply them separately to subgroups within a single plan. So, as you get out in larger companies or larger, you know, separate lines of business within a company or family of companies, there are a lot of things that you can do to structure and design your plans among your different subsidiaries, your different brother sister corporations. So at the end of the day, they all have to pass on an, you know, for the most part, on an aggregate basis, they need to pass certain tests. There's also limits on the benefits and contributions that go into a plan. Um, just generally speaking, the amount of, co you know, compensation is often the factor against which benefits and limits are measured. And that adjusts every year. The compensation limit is $200,000, but it gets adjusted 
for uh, cost of living. So for this year, 2015, that you know the highest compensation you can figure on is 265,000. Then there are limits on how much you can earn in a benefit or be added to a year as an annual contribution each year. These are called 415 limits, which a lot of you I'm sure have heard about. In a defined contribution plan, uh, the annual addition to someone's account can't exceed the lesser of the participant's compensation for the year or $40,000 index, so that would be $53,000 for the year 2015. In a defined benefit plan, at the end of the day, you know, you're looking at a benefit of um, its index of, uh, off of a base of 160, so you really can't be funding for a benefit in the year 2015 of of, of more than 210,000. So these are all you know factors you should keep in mind when you're designing and working with your your plans. And then you have you know non-discrimination rules. Um, again, these are these are tests uh, in terms of the benefits that are available. You know you look at highly compensated versus non-highly compensated. There are various tests out there, but it's also important to remember that you that you it's not just the benefit. It's it's the availability of investment options and and it could be the procedures for granting loans. In other words, if a rank and file employee had a higher hurdle to clear to get a 401k loan than someone at the executive level, you know that could that could be a problem. And some some this is something that we see sometimes in a very subtle way when we're working on the investment side with our clients. If investment benefits such as a brokerage window is an, is made available only to the executives but not the rank and file as an investment option in the 401k, that could be a discrimination problem. That means the plan itself could not be offering the same benefits across the board to everyone properly. So that becomes a plan qualification issue. Or if um, the plan subsidizes certain benefits in, in a sense that only the highly compensated are taking advantage of it, you might end up with a problem there. So a lot of things, a lot of complex rules to to look at. And there's also the concept of uh, top-heavy rules, uh, which uh, is a situation where um, I guess the highly compensated would be considered to be holding too high a percentage of the benefits under a plan or a group of plans. And, and this happens if 60% if, uh, or more of the benefits are held by key employees and top-heavy plans have their own set of consequences. So there's a lot right, a lot there to think about in terms of these qualification issues. Then there's some other special rules that don't that you know that apply to DBs and and some other plans. There's rules about you know there's a general prohibition on in-service distrib distributions um, for the most part. There are special rules about the structure and formation of of annuities under the old defined benefit plans, qualified joint and survivor annuities. There's a set of rules on spousal death benefits uh, in a defined benefit. If a, mar if a married participant dies before receiving benefits, the plan has to provide a death benefit to the spouse or partner. And that has to take the form of a qualified pre-retirement survivor annuity. Some very complex stuff there. Benefits all have to be uh, definitely determinable, determinable in a defined benefit world, um, which means that at any given point in time, the dollar value of those accrued benefits, which become payable at normal time and age, are, can be calculated, you know, according to a formula and the actuarial assumptions and what have you. There's some special minimum participation requirements. A lot of times we'll get in a small situation. We'll get a situation where we have a very you know, we might have a four, five, six, seven, eight person company, and the owner says, "Look, I'd uh, he or she, I'd lo I'd love for my spouse and I, or my partner and I, to have a defined benefit, and we'll do a we'll do a 401k for everyone else." But there's some rules. You if 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 an employer has between three and um, well, there, there's a minimum number of uh, of there's a minimum number of non-excludable employees that that you could have in a defined benefit plan. And basically, you have to cover 40% of the employees if you have between three and I think it's 124, 125 employees. So that's that's not going to work. You can't do it just for just for two in those situations. So finally, I would just add into this defined benefit world, in addition to some special participation rules that make it not necessarily available in every scenario. There's also um, a set of rules about minimum benefit accruals. It's kind of like a, that kind of matches the minimum vesting requirements. There's sort of a minimum benefit accrual that results in a minimum benefit accrual for you know for each year of service. 
So, and, and the purpose of this rule is to prevent arrangements that are that, that kind of backload benefit accruals to such a significant degree that they that they uh, might look like they comply with vesting standards, but the reality is they require really long periods of service in order to get a meaningful benefit. And uh, that that concept of backloading is uh, is not forbidden, not 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 permitted, I should say. And then, of course, the, you know, minimum funding as well. You have to if you have a defined benefit, you have to put in a certain amount of certain amount of dollars every year. And those are some very, very complex standards. Uh, and a lot of times those are done with actuaries and kind of under the supervision of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation as well as the Internal Revenue Service. Special rules for 401k, which a lot of you listening today are probably a little more tuned in on. 401ks are very popular, very powerful forces in the retirement industry right now. And, uh, you know, just some of the special rules that apply, for uh, example, you know, there's a limit on your pre-tax elective contribution. The, the amounts attributable to elective deferrals, you know, can't be distributed until termination of employment, participant dies or becomes disabled, um, age 59 and a half, you know, in a profit sharing plan scenario anyway, or stock bonus hardship. Uh, the plan terminates and the employer doesn't establish another another plan. Uh, and there's some special exceptions for people in military service. There's also some special rules about plan loans that you are aware of. And again, just to round out the discussion, there's also, um, in addition to all these internal revenue code rules that we've been talking about, there's a, there are a lot of rules uh, under ERISA that apply in the qualified sense and uh, again as I mentioned before these have to there has to be a written document it has to describe the benefit structure it has to outline uh, the day-to-day -day operation identify at least one named fiduciary that's typically the employer assets must be held in trust with very few exceptions the trust provisions must be in writing in the plan document the trust must be managed and controlled by a trustee unless that authority is somehow delegated um, under one of the delegation provisions in ERISA. And uh, there's also a lot to be said under ERISA about the importance of investment policies and guidelines and summary plan descriptions and other disclosures and participant statements and what have you. So that's a lot that we just talked about in the last 20, 25 minutes, an awful lot of things that apply. I hope some, I hope some of them you know, resonate for you in terms of things you might have seen or heard or questions that you can be on the alert when you when you hear about from your clients or participants. Now, just um, just to get to talk a little bit in contradistinction of you know qualified plans and non qualified plans. Obviously, non qualified plans are very. I mean, they can be structured to, to provide benefits and defer them to the future, but they're not. They don't get the same tax treatment under the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, therefore, they're not, they're not subject necessarily to all these qualification rules. Um, they, they might be called, uh, some of them might qualify as what we call top hat plans, which means if they're limited to a very selective few at the management level, they don't need to meet mo not only the Internal Revenue Code, but they would need, need to meet most of the ERISA requirements as well. And um, there's a lot that happens in this area, and, a lot, and I would simply say here that um, there are really four differences, you know, a couple of key differences between tax qualified plans and non qualified plans. On the tax qualified side, you know, you, you have rules that prohibit discrimination in favor of the highly compensated. There are limits on contributions and benefits. There are standards that relate to eligibility and participation, investing, and funding. Plans have to be funded, and the employee's deferred comp is not taxed until paid. On the non qualified side, you know, most of these rules don't apply. There's no minimum standard uh, under ERISA, for example. Plans are going to be unfunded. And here the employee is not going to be taxed until payment or constructive receipt comes into play. So there's some, those are some of the key differences between tax and, and uh, tax plans, qualified plans, and non-qualified plans. How do you choose? I mean, how do you sit back? You're, you're, you know, maybe a client comes to you and says, you know, I have a 401k. What else should we do? Or you're a sponsor saying, I've got a 401k. How can I augment that? Or, or I've, I've been a startup and I gave all my employees stock options. Now, now I'm a more mature company. How do I choose a retirement vehicle? 
And, you know, there's, just, there's obviously a lot to think about. I think once you understand the various types of qualified plans that are out there, um, you have to figure out which plan is going to best meet your needs in terms of retaining employees and, and which best, best fits into your budget. Um, you, have to, you have to really understand kind of like, you know, what's, your, what's the nature of your business and your goals in terms of a ret uh, what kind of plan you're offering. What are the needs of the employees who are going to be benefiting from this plan? You know, from the employer perspective, you know, how is the business organized? Are you part of a controlled group with other entities? Do you lease employees? How long have you been in existence? Are there any predecessors uh, whose history you are, you are continuing on? Do you already offer other fringe benefits or um, other forms of compensation to be looked at in a whole, holistic sense along with the qualified plans? Do you have union employees or are you, are you concerned about the potential for a union, which simply triggers a different type of plan under what we call multi-employer plan rules. Um, how old are our employees? How, how long do people work there? What kind of earnings are they have? And, and, and what kind of earnings are, are, are available to people who are covered? How much is the employer willing to spend? What is the employer's real culture? Are you paternalistic, where you feel it's a responsibility to take care of and help prepare your employees for the future? Or do you have more of a uh, individualistic type approach where it's not your business, it's not your problem, you pay people well, and it's up to your employees to take care of their futures. Uh, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of different places to fit on that spectrum. And, and do you want employees to partially or fully share on the cost? To the extent you have a plan, or any benefit for that matter, do you want to fund it totally on your own, or are you going to ask employees to share part of that cost? Then you have to think about you know who the you know who who the benefit is in terms of the employees, um, for the owners. I mean, an employee benefit or, or qualified retirement plan can be a way of augmenting or or um, adding to current you know well not current income but their their salary their, their long term benefit if you will. It's a deferral for retirement. There's some very important estate planning considerations. You've got key employees that are in management positions. These are going to be highly compensated, so there might be some limits on what you do for them, but they're critical to the business. Are you going to treat them the same as an owner? Are you going to reward them for all their past service? How are you going to keep them as, a, as an employee? And then do you make a distinction in terms of benefit, availability, and, and, and richness with rank and file? Um, how does, it, how does that mesh with uh, federal programs like Social Security or state programs like uh, workers' comp? And now, of course, we have mandated health benefits to put into the mix. So there's a lot of, th a lot of things to think about there. And again, just to uh, talk a little bit about, you know, choosing these plans, you know, the, 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 thing, about these, the thing about the tax plan, the tax advantage plan, is that, you, is that the, um, the primary advantage of a, of a qualified plan for the employer is you get, a, you get an immediate and an ongoing tax benefit. You get a deduction for the money that goes in. And um, you have some flexibility in design. There's some different ways you can go. But, you know, in a non-qualified plan, there's no deduction until the employee receives a distribution of benefits or is deemed to be in constructive receipt of, of the money. The disadvantage of a tax qualified plan, uh, or one of the disadvantages, arguably, is that they're subject to a host of requirements and restrictions and compliance. There's a lot of work to, to keep them going. And uh, they, they can't be discriminatory, which a lot of people, uh, especially as smaller businesses and employers, don't always want to don't always want to work around that. So some things that you know, some things you can do with a qualified plan. Um, you can there are some things you can do to maximize the benefits of the owners or the management team. For example, if the owners or management team are, are, are older, you can use what's called age-weighted discretionary profit sharing. That basically allocates a little more money to the older than to the younger. Of course, this has to be sub this is still subject to various IRS discrimination testing. But there's some things they can do that that are permissible. If you have a large turnover, um, you can have some vesting and, and recapture. Uh, a lot of a lot a lot of things that you can do in terms of design. I think on the uh, you know on the non-qualified side, you know the advantages are you know if if an employer is 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 trying to deliver benefits to an exclusive group, 
of highly compensated employees. Maybe it's, in effect, it's a golden handcuff or a way to retain them or reward them. Um, Non-qualified plans work really well because you know if you leave, for example, you forfeit. It becomes a very fancy golden handcuff. These non-qualified plans aren't subject to all these all the requirements and limitations that we identified earlier. It can be pretty flexible who receives them, and the amount of benefits can be can vary from individual to individual. They can be structured um, in, a, in a fashion very similar to a defined benefit plan where you're targeting a benefit or a defined contribution where you're simply allocating and building an account. And you can do some tax planning, provided you satisfy 409A, the tax deferral rules. So there are a lot of things you can do, and ultimately the cost of providing benefits can be shared between, you know, among the employer and the employee. Um, but one of the disadvantages is that these non-qualified plans can't be funded, which means that plan contributions are notional. Contributions are they're not made to a separate trust that holds the assets, which means that the employer doesn't receive an immediate deduction. Well, I, I would add parenthetically that we can, you can use, you know, a rabbi trust. You can hold it separately, even though you're not getting the deductions. And non-qualified plans, you know, can't really include a broader group of employees because once you once it starts to look like you're designing a long-term retirement benefit for a group of employees, it looks like the definition of pension plan, and you get you get swung back into the ERISA requirements. So there you have it. Uh, some of the types of qualified plans, uh, an example of the host of rules that can apply across the board and individually to a 401k or to a um, defined benefit type plan. Some of the advantages of these plans, a little bit of comparison with non-qualified, just to give you some perspective. And, uh, you know, we hope this has been hope helpful to you in terms of fielding questions from your clients or doing your own planning on a going forward basis. We're glad to help you. Please let us know if you have any questions. We'll respond after the webinar if you shoot any questions to me at my email address, and uh, I will respond directly to you. I also invite you to join us for our next webinar on August 26. We're going to be, I'm going to have a session on control groups. And the reason I'm doing that is because, as many of you know, if you are part of a brother-sister group of corporations or a parent subsidiary group of corporations or affiliated partnership structures, the rules for designing your plan, who to include, who must you include, how do you test for, for qualification, you have to aggregate among the entire group, not just within your own company, to make sure that your plan is qualified and the plan of your fellow corporation is, or partnership is qualified. It's one of the most misunderstood and and oftentimes abused uh, provisions in the sense that people aren't aware of how far it reaches and you end up in a situation where we have non-qualified plans that need to be restored back to qualification status. So that's going to be the topic of our next session on August 26th. We'll be sending you an invitation for that. On behalf of the Wagner Law Group, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, and we will see you in the future. Thank you very much.